Hey guys, it's Kimberly from Mini Meadows Farm and the long awaited video is finally here. Man, after I posted the pictures of our garden on our Facebook page, Mini Meadows Farm, Oklahoma, little did I know how it was going to go absolutely nuts. Um, I just thought, oh hey, here's my garden. I like it and if you like it too and you kind of want to know how to do it, um, here's why you should. And it just went absolutely nuts. And since then, I have found pictures of our garden everywhere. Um, I found pictures of our garden on Pinterest, Instagram, Google Images, different websites. And um, in the comments, I had so many questions about, you know, how to go about doing something like this, how to construct it, what to use, what to plant, um, how to maintain it, uh, different concerns. And I tried to answer as many as I possibly could, but like I said, the post just went nuts. And I, I just thought the best way to go about this was just make a video. And I don't know about you guys, but I don't like to do the part one, part two, follow along to learn more. I'm impatient and I like the start to finish. So that is what I did. So you didn't have to suffer through that last season. I documented from start to finish and made one video for you guys. So I know it took a long time and I'm sorry, but you're welcome. Now I did go back through the original Facebook post and I wrote down all the questions and I tried to make sure that I got all of them answered in this video. Now, with that being said, for some of my more seasoned gardeners, if I am addressing something that seems a little obvious or common sense, humble yourselves um, and just try to keep in mind that I'm probably trying to answer somebody's question that they asked and just try to remember what it was like for you when you were a new beginner gardener and you felt completely overwhelmed and clueless. So my goal here with all my videos that I'm going to be putting out is to reach a broad audience for not just advanced gardeners, but for beginning gardeners too, to be able to relate to both. All right, without further ado, let's get growing. As you all well know, vertical gardening has become extremely popular these days. More and more people are showing interest in it, and maybe you're watching this video because you're curious and you want to see what all the hype is about. Well, here are a list of reasons why you should consider growing your garden vertically. Well, the actual definition of vertical gardening is a garden in which the plants are supported to grow along vertical, often tiered surfaces, especially fences, posts, trellises, and walls, rather than along the ground. Okay, now that we've got that out of the way, let's go ahead and hop right to it. Reason number one, you can grow more in less space. Not everybody's got a huge yard. Not everybody's got a ton of land. You can grow a ton of produce in a much smaller space if you grow your garden vertically. Reason number two. If you live in town, it can provide a beautiful privacy screen. Sure, it's only for a season, but if you're like most people, you're only outside during the warmer months anyways, and that's probably when you'll need it the most. So just enjoy it while it's there and while it lasts. Reason number three, it increases accessibility and is so much easier to harvest your yields. If you have mobility issues or if you have a bad back and you just can't garden like you used to, or if you're getting into gardening and this is something you really want to do, but you don't think that you can, then this is for you. Trying to get your produce up off the ground and bending over constantly, it can put a lot of strain on your body and your back, but doing it this way takes all of that out of it. So definitely this is the way to go for you. Number four, it keeps crops up and off the ground so it provides great pest prevention and prevents ground rot. In the past, I have tried several different methods to keep my pumpkins and my melons up off the ground to try and prevent ground rot. 
I've also tried several different methods to keep the chickens from eating my pumpkins and my melons before they reached full maturity. This has been the only method that I have found that works where I can get my produce to reach full maturity without anything eating them or them rotting on the ground. Number five, it provides proper airflow to keep diseases, funguses, and powdery mildew down, which results in healthier plants. Now, anytime you're growing any kind of pumpkin or squash plant, you're going to have issues with powdery mildew. I have seen a huge decrease in dealing with any kind of funguses such as powdery mildew in my plants that I grow vertically. It helps a ton with not only powdery mildew, but also with being able to detect any kind of bugs, uh, squash bugs, because you can see the undersides of their leaves and where they lay their eggs, and you can stop a problem before it ever becomes a problem. Number six, it provides a higher crop yield. Now in the past, I have grown several of the crops that I now grow vertically, I've grown on the ground. And I can tell you, I see a huge difference in how much produce that I'm actually getting vertically as opposed to what I was getting when I was trying to grow them on the ground. I see a huge difference um, in my sugar pie pumpkins, in my cantaloupes, in my melons. I just definitely see a higher crop yield whenever I grow a lot of these crops. Number seven more sun exposure now this one might just be for me because whenever i would grow a lot of these crops on the ground i did not do good weed control i would try but we have bermuda grass and a lot of times my pumpkin patches and melon patches would be overtaken by weeds so sun exposure was not too great when i tried to grow a lot of these crops on the ground which is also probably why my crop yield wasn't too great so i've noticed definitely growing these crops vertically they get a lot more sun because they are not competing with all the weeds that they were having to try to grow through when i was trying to grow them on the ground which brings me to number eight weed control whenever you're growing a more traditional pumpkin squash or melon patch you're having to mulch and do constant weed control whenever you're growing these things vertically the only thing you have to worry about is the bed or the plot that they are planted in you don't have to worry about a large space to constantly have to fight to keep the weeds out of you just have to worry about the little small space that the plants are planted in to keep free of weeds and that's it which ends up being a huge time saver nine cleaner and more visually appealing crops because they are not in the dirt and are able to grow to their true shape with no flat sides or discoloration from sitting in the dirt okay so in this list we have gone over several different reasons why vertical gardening is beneficial why you should do it all the pros but i think that maybe this one is probably one of my favorites as a gardener, there is nothing more frustrating than to spend all this time prepping your soil, planting your seeds, and harvesting your crop only to turn it over and to find out that the bottom has developed ground rot. Or it looks like you're growing the most beautiful and perfect pumpkin or winter squash, then you pick it up and find out that it's deformed or discolored from being in constant contact with the ground. Even if you're new to gardening, you'll probably still be familiar with what I'm talking about if you've ever gone to your local pumpkin patch and tried to pick out that perfect pumpkin. There's usually always a side of misshapen and miscolored imperfection from laying in the dirt. I'm telling you guys, the most beautiful, proportionate, cleanest, photogenic crops I have ever grown was when I grew them in this way. All right, well, that is my list of why I think that you should grow your garden vertically. Now, if you're still on board and you're convinced, let's go ahead and hop right into how you grow your garden vertically. Let's get going. Okay, step one and probably the most important step is choosing the location of your garden. You're going to want to pick a location that gets the most amount of sunlight. Now, a lot of these plants that you're going to be planting for your vertical tunnels require full sunlight. So choosing the direction 
that your tunnels are going to be going is vital also. My tunnels are planted east to west. That just means that the sun, when it comes up, it follows the whole path of my tunnels so that all my plants are getting maximum sun exposure. If you planted your beds the opposite direction, that means that you're only going to get sun on half of your plants half of the day. So the direction that your beds and your tunnels are facing is also extremely important as well. Now, is it impossible to move your beds after they've been set? No, but why would you do that? Just start this project from the beginning with a clear and ready plan. Map out your garden space where your plants will be getting the most sun exposure and the direction of the sun's path. All right, now that we have chosen a good location, let's talk about what materials we're gonna need. Now, there are tons of different ways that you can build raised garden beds. You could even direct sow your seeds directly into the ground if you wanted to and trellis the vines as they started to grow. But what I'm going to show you guys and go over is how we did ours here on our farm. Now, I have several garden tunnels out here ranging in different lengths, but they're all basically made with the same concept. Now these are the materials that we use to make our garden beds. Two by eight cedar wood, T-post, 16 by four cattle panels, baling wire, weed barrier, dirt, compost, seeds. My short beds are 12 feet long with three cattle panels and four T-posts. My long beds are 24 feet long with six cattle panels and six T-posts. We made our raised garden beds using two by eight cedar wood. Now the garden planting space is about two feet wide. Now for our arch, we used a 16 by four cattle panel. They are also called hog panels or feedlot panels. They are 16 feet long, four feet high. They're made of welded galvanized steel. They don't rust. They're said to last up to 20 years. Now, as you can see, what I'm trying to demonstrate in this video is that they are flexible, they're very strong and sturdy, but they still, they'll still need to be secured with a T-post. Now, you can pick these up at your local farm stores, um, Tractor Supply, Atwoods, Orchlands, just whatever you have that's local and available to you. Now, make sure before you put dirt in your raised beds that you have your cattle panels ready so that you can move your beds if need be because the distance between your beds determines the height of your arch. Now my beds, these specific beds, are about four feet apart. You can customize the height of your arch to meet your specific needs by placing your raised beds either closer or further apart. Now keep in mind, you'll wanna be able to reach the top to work your vines and harvest your yield. Okay, so just for a quick reference, I'm 5'9". And like I said, these beds are placed four feet apart and the height is perfect for me to maneuver around and to reach whatever I need to. Now, since these beds were already built, I just had Blake go ahead and demonstrate how easy it is for one person to install the arch. Now, this is the raised garden bed over our storm cellar. So this was actually towards the end of the season. And after we did this little demonstration, I actually just ended up leaving it and planting a few pumpkin seeds. But Unfortunately, the growing time left before our first frost wasn't long enough to yield much of a harvest, but it was still kind of a neat little experiment. So as you can see here, you're just putting one end down where you're wanting it to go, bending it into an arch, and then putting the other end down. Now that you've tested the height and made sure that it's good to go, set your cattle panels aside for a minute and grab your T-posts. At this point, you'll want to go ahead and drive your T-posts into the ground at the locations needed. You will need at least two on each ends and two at least every three cattle panels. Once you have your posts in place, you can start assembling your arch. On a longer bed, I recommend starting in the middle and working your way out in case you have a little bit of an overhang. There's nothing wrong with having the arch extend a little further than the raised beds. In fact, all of mine do. But just to make sure that it's equal on both ends, it's best, like I said, to just start in the middle. As you're placing your panels, make sure that you're not leaving any space between them because they will need to be close enough to be wired together in the next step. Okay, so next step. Once you have all your panels in an arch and you're happy with it and the way that it's looking, 
uh, go ahead and start wiring the arches together. Now, I started at the very top, trying to make sure that I got them as close and as even as possible so that your tunnel shape isn't all wonky. So after you've wired the tops of all the panels together to make one solid tunnel, continue this process down the sides and wherever you see fit or necessary to ensure its stability and its strength. Now, after you have all the tunnel wired together, it is time to fasten and secure your arch to your T-post. Now, what you should be left with is one solid uniform arch that is secure enough to withstand high winds and strong enough to support the weight of your vertical harvest. Next, you're going to want to place some kind of weed barrier down at the bottom of your raised planter beds. Now, I have used store-bought and I've also used recycled cardboard boxes and honestly, I've had the same exact results with both. All right, now it is time to fill your beds. Now you can buy dirt, but just fair warning in case you've never done it on this scale, it can be quite costly. So what I did and what I always do to fill my garden beds is I just go out to the back of our land and I manually dig up topsoil. Now I know that that's not always an option for everybody that you don't have land and you don't have that accessible to you but if you know somebody that does have land or if you know somebody that's digging a pool or something I'm sure that they won't mind letting you go to the back of their land and digging up some of their dirt or letting you have some of their dirt from the pool that they're digging or something. There's ways that you can get free dirt without having to go to a big box store and spending tons of money on dirt to fill your garden beds. So to give you some perspective, I've calculated what it would have cost me to fill these three beds with bags of soil. Now you can get online and find what's called a soil calculator to calculate the amount of soil for your raised beds. So these three raised beds are 24 feet long by two feet wide by eight inches deep times three beds equaling 96 cubic feet. For the big bags of garden soil that comes to three cubic feet per bag. So I would need a total of 32 bags of soil to fill these beds. The average cost of good quality all-purpose garden soil is $8 per bag. The average cost of raised bed garden soil is $12 per bag. Bringing my grand total to fill these beds with all-purpose garden soil to $256 or with the raised bed garden soil to 384 and that is before tax if you do not have a farm tax. So you can see what I'm talking about when I say this can be very costly if you do it this way. After I dig my topsoil, I heavily amend it with compost. Now, keep in mind, this is not a traditional garden. It's not traditionally space. This is not a square foot garden. You are planting a lot of heavy feeder plants very close together. So it is vital that you are starting with a nutrient rich soil because your plants are going to be fighting each other for their nutrients. Now that we have our arches built and our beds filled, it is finally time to purchase some seeds. Now this is where it can get a little tricky and confusing, especially if you're new. When choosing a seed variety for your vertical garden, you're going to want to make sure that the description says that it is a vining variety and not a bush variety. Even a semi-vining variety isn't going to give you the look that you're going for. Um, not the look that is basically what I'm showing in my garden and in my um, beds over here. You can read the description online or in the catalog or on the back of the seed packet and it will usually tell you they must be a vining variety in order to climb the trellis. As far as where to purchase your seeds, I know that you guys have seen them at all your big box stores, but you can also purchase them from seed catalogs and online. These are my favorite catalogs. I do like to stick with the heirloom varieties and save my seeds and reuse them for the next year. Now to take some of the confusion out and give you a little bit of a head start, I've made a list and these are all trellis approved, 
vining and not bush varieties that either I've successfully grown in my garden or I know someone else that has had success in their garden with these varieties. So one thing that I definitely wanted to address that I was very surprised ended up being a huge concern to a lot of people when this post went viral on Facebook was um, a lot of people were very, very concerned with getting hit in the head by a falling pumpkin or squash or gourd or getting a concussion. And um, I just wanted to let everybody know that, you know, yeah, every great once in a while, a pumpkin or a squash will fall off the vine. Um, if it breaks, it just becomes chicken food and there's no harm done. There's only a couple inches between my head and the top of the arch. So you actually kind of have to duck and weave while you're navigating through the tunnel. So with that being said, I have never been hit in the head by a falling pumpkin or gourd and since they're all like smaller varieties anyways there really wouldn't be any harm done either way to my great surprise this really was a huge concern to a lot of people in the online community and i just wanted to let everybody know you're safe and and if this is something you really wanted to do but you're worried you can always wear a helmet <laughs> now with that being said all summer squash are bush varieties and they grow upright. Now some may have longer stems than others, rambling just a few feet from the plant's base, but none are actually vines. You can stake them and I've actually semi-trained my summer squash up a trellis. I, I still do, but I had to use old fabric to tie it up because the vines are much bigger and stronger. I couldn't do it the way that I do my other vining varieties out here on my more traditional arch trellis. So here is a list of non-vining varieties, bush varieties. You have your yellow summer squash, your crook neck, straight neck, early. Uh, you have your scallop squash, some people call them patty pans. Your acorn squash, your zucchini varieties, your eggplants, regular and string varieties. Now, there is more things that are bush varieties that you can't grow, but here's just a basic outline of what you for sure can't grow up a trellis. When planting your seeds, just follow your zone's recommended time to direct sow outside in the ground. Um, that's just usually going to be after your last freeze. Now, if you don't know your gardening zone, you can find it on the Farmer's Almanac website. Now, you're going to want to plant your seeds according to the recommended depth on the back of each seed packet. But because we're doing this differently, um, we're not doing a traditional garden. Remember, you're going to ignore the recommended spacing. Okay, we have purchased our seeds and our last frost is over with according to our gardening zone and we are ready to plant. Starting closest to the cattle panel, we are going to plant our seeds two inches away from the wooden side of the planter box. Now I only space my seeds six inches away from each other which is very contradictory to what the seed packaging in the directions on the back is going to tell you. But since the vines are going to be growing and directed up and not sprawling out, that is what's gonna make all the difference. I then plant a second row approximately eight inches behind the first row in between the empty spaces. Now this will allow me to direct the vines between the two plants in front without disrupting them. Okay, well, when all the plants start coming in, I am not gonna lie, it's gonna be a little chaotic. If you have OCD or are a control freak, this is gonna be a little stressful for you because I know no matter how many times I do it, every year, it, it stresses me out. But what you're gonna wanna do is you're going to want to find the tail end, which is basically the vining part of each plant and start directing it towards the cattle panel. Once the vines are long enough, we are going to start directing them up the trellis. And we are going to start weaving the vines one by one and securing them every eight to 12 inches with sturdy metal plant twists. Now the back and forth weaving of the vines in a basket type formation is what creates 
better weight distribution and is why the heavier produce is actually able to hang on without breaking the vine. Now these metal plant twists that I use are reusable. So if you end up using the same ones that I'm using, don't throw them away at the end of the season. I just usually leave mine up all year long and the next season they're there, they're cut at the right size and it's super convenient. Now what I am doing here is what you will need to do throughout the season. When you find any vines that are hanging, just weave them back in the trellis and secure them. As the vines begin to grow, if any fruit starts to produce before it reaches the trellis, I just go ahead and snap it off to allow the plant and the vines to get better established. Now, is this a lot of work? Yes, but if you are keeping up with it and going out every day to every other day and doing a little at a time, then it will seem less overwhelming. Now, there are a lot of benefits to being so involved and hands-on with your garden. So as I'm working my vines, I'm also checking for any pest and disease outbreaks. Early detection and acting quickly will lead to a much healthier garden. Now I grow a lot of different varieties of melons, gourds, pumpkins, squash, beans, cucumbers, you name it. I mostly try and stick with the smaller varieties for the melon, squash, and gourds, but I definitely like to push the limits here and there just to see what I can get away with when it comes to the pumpkins and winter squash. Now, as far as materials to use for your raised beds, cedar is best because it's going to be exposed to the elements and you don't want your wood to warp or rot. Now, pressure treated wood contains chemicals that will leach into your soil and contaminate your crop. Um, that's the same with railroad ties and old telephone poles. So you don't want to use those either. Those are big no-nos when you're growing anything that you're going to consume. You don't even have to use a raised bed you can direct sow your seeds straight into the ground and just secure your arch with a t-post you can use cinder blocks you can use rocks you can be as creative as you want to be when it comes to your raised beds but like I mentioned before there are just a few things that you definitely don't want to use when it comes to making your raised beds especially for food consumption some people will use slings made of pantyhose, old t-shirts, or you can purchase them specifically for this online. I myself have not experimented with slings. Um, I just like to experiment with different varieties and just see which ones do best. I'm not saying that I won't in the future, I just have not yet. But obviously, if you are not wanting to mess with these things, uh, if you don't want to mess with slings, then just sticking with the smaller varieties is just going to be your best bet. Now, a concern for a lot of people was snakes and spiders in their tunnels. Now, I know every location is different, but where I'm from in central Oklahoma, I personally have not had any issues with snakes in my garden tunnels, nor have I had any issues with spiders or spider webs, but that's probably just because I'm in them every day. Now, if you're watching this and you're starting to feel a bit overwhelmed and you're thinking that there's no way I'm going to have enough time to go out every day, every other day and train these vines and secure these vines and maintain something like this, then I highly suggest that you start with growing a bean and loofah tunnel. Now, both of these will climb the trellis unassisted. The loofahs don't set fruit until the latter end of the growing season, so planting beans alongside it, pole beans, will give you something to harvest in the meantime. Now, same thing with beans. You're going to have two different varieties, and I made sure that in the list that I supplied earlier, I put the beans that I am growing in my garden. Um, you're going to have bush beans, and you're going to have climbing pole beans. So I made sure that I put the exact variety that I grow in my garden that I approve of in the list. All right, now it's time to go over watering. I water every two to three days in the beginning, then every day to every other day, depending on how hot the weather is, where you're located. Here in Oklahoma, it gets very hot in our summers. Um, when the temperatures were up over 100, I watered every day. Now, remember, you have a lot of plants in a small space competing for water. So I water the beds with a regular water hose. You can set up a drip irrigation system if you'd like, but I figure since I'm out there every day anyways, um, watering by hand just doesn't really bother me. 
it is important to not get the foliage wet. A lot of these squash and melon plants are susceptible to powdery mildew, so getting a sprinkler system is definitely not gonna be ideal. You wanna just water the base of the plants only. All right, now fertilizer. When you have this many plants in a small, compact space, they will definitely be fighting for not only water, but nutrients. So any type of pumpkin, squash, or melon are going to be what's called a heavy feeder. So making sure that you are fertilizing enough is an absolute must. There are tons of store brand fertilizers out there, but what I use on our farm is goat manure. For one, it is readily available and it's free but it is also one of the best fertilizers, in my opinion, and it's what they also consider a cold fertilizer, meaning it doesn't have to be composted first before you use it. You can add it directly to your garden and it won't burn up your plants, unlike chicken, horse, or cow manure. If you are not fertilizing your plants and they are not getting enough nutrients, then they just will not grow good. They will not thrive. They will not produce very much fruit. You will not get a good harvest and the fruit that it does produce will be more susceptible to what's called blossom and rot or it will not reach its full maturity. Okay now it is time to cover garden pests. Now in our area our most common pests are squash bugs, aphids, cucumber beetles, and vine bowers. Now, I don't like using any harmful pesticides because I try to be very mindful of our pollinators. So a few of the methods that I use to control the pest population is over winter, our chickens are free range, so they help a ton with scratching up anything that is laying dormant or that could be a potential problem the following season. The chickens go back in their run until the plants are established and up on the trellis. Then I let them back out to help eat any of the low-lying bugs. The chickens have to be put in their run during the planting season or they will scratch up and eat any and all of my seeds that I have just sown. Now a few other things that I use is placing yellow cups in the corners of all of my beds filled half full with soapy water. A lot of these pests are attracted to the color and fall in and drown. Same thing with the yellow sticky traps that I will hang in certain areas of my garden. The bugs are attracted to the yellow color and get stuck to it. For the squash bugs, I remove a lot of them just by hand and any eggs that I see, I just use a piece of scotch tape. Diatomaceous earth is also a great product to use for a lot of these pests, including vine bowers. For aphids, I remove as much as the infected area as I can and blast the plant with a water hose. And one of my favorite pest deterrents is marigolds. They repel a ton of harmful insects and attract a lot of good ones that will help ward off the bat. I plant all my marigold seeds at the exact same time I plant all the rest of my seeds. Um, I plant them at the furthest away from the cattle panel, about four or five inches from the wood. And they usually don't take off uh, really good at first because they're a little bit shaded from the leaves and the vines from the plants. But once they are up and established on the trellis, it gives the marigolds a chance to really start taking off. And about the time that they're really good and in full bloom is about the time that the plants really need them the most and they can be the most beneficial when the plants are the most established. Now a lot of you are probably wondering about these plants cross-pollinating. Now first let's go ahead and address what is cross-pollination. Cross-pollination is when the pollen from one plant is transported either by wind or insects to the flower of another plant. The genes from the two plants then combine to create a seed with genetic characteristics of both parents. Now there is a lot of myths about cross-pollination, so let me clear some up. Cross-pollination can only occur between members of the same species. So cucumbers cannot cross with squash and melons, and melons cannot cross with squash, and so on and so forth. Cross-pollination only affects the seeds, not the fruit of this year. 
So if a spaghetti squash and a pumpkin cross pollinate, the squash and the pumpkins that you get this year will be completely fine and will look and taste the same. That is because the type of fruit a plant produces this season is determined by the seed it was planted from and not the seed it will produce. Now, if you are worried about cross-pollination and saving your seeds, you can always just purchase new seeds every season. And last but not least, a question that we got a lot of was, what do we do with all this produce? Well, we eat a lot of it. Um, we can it, vacuum seal it, and freeze it. Um, we also save a lot of the winter squash and pumpkins for a winter food source for our animals. The gourds I use for fall decorations and the loofahs I dry out and use for different projects and gifts. Okay, well, I hope that that answered a lot of you guys' questions, and I will have a lot more videos coming out, um, so be on the lookout. And if you yourself have decided that you are going to grow your own vertical garden this year, I would love to keep up with you guys. Um, you can follow us on our Mini Meadows Farm Oklahoma Facebook page, our Instagram, and our TikTok. Um, until next time, God bless.